Chapter 26, From the Red Sea to Sinai. This chapter is based on Exodus 15, 22-27, and chapters 16-18. to From the Red Sea, the hosts of Israel again set forth on their journey, under the guidance of the pillar of cloud. The scene around them was most dreary, bare, desolate-looking mountains, barren plains, and the sea stretching far away, its shores strewn with the bodies of their enemies. Yet they were full of joy in the consciousness of freedom, and every thought of discontent was hushed. But for three days as they journeyed, they could find no water. The supply which they had taken with them was exhausted. There was nothing to quench their burning thirst as they dragged wearily over the sunburnt plains. Moses, who was familiar with this region, knew what the others did not, that at Merah, the nearest station where springs were to be found, the water was unfit for use. With intense anxiety, he watched the guiding cloud. With a sinking heart, he heard the glad shout, Water! Water! echoed along the line. Men, women, and children in joyous haste crowded to the fountain, when, lo, a cry of anguish burst forth from the host. The water was bitter. In their horror and despair, they reproached Moses for having led them in such a way, not remembering that the divine presence in that mysterious cloud had been leading him as well as them. In his grief at their distress, Moses did what they had forgotten to do. He cried earnestly to God for help, and the Lord showed him a tree which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Here the promise was given to Israel through Moses, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. From Merah the people journeyed to Elam, where they found twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees. Here they remained several days before entering the wilderness of Sin. When they had been a month absent from Egypt, they made their first encampment in the wilderness. Their store of provisions had now begun to fail. There was scanty herbage in the wilderness, and their flocks were diminishing. How was food to be supplied for these vast multitudes? Doubts filled their hearts, and again they murmured. Even the rulers and elders of the people joined in complaining against the leaders of God's appointment. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They had not as yet suffered from hunger. Their present wants were supplied, but they feared for the future. They could not understand how these vast multitudes were to subsist in their travels through the wilderness, and in imagination they saw their children famishing. The Lord permitted difficulties to surround them, and their supply of food to be cut short, that their hearts might turn to Him who had hitherto been their deliverer. If in their want they would call upon Him, He would still grant them manifest tokens of His love and care. He had promised that if they would obey His commandments, no disease should come upon them, and it was sinful unbelief on their part to anticipate that they or their children might die of hunger. God had promised to be their God, to take them to Himself as a people, and to lead them to a large and good land. But they were ready to faint at every obstacle encountered in the way to that land. In a marvelous manner He had brought them out from their bondage in Egypt, that he might elevate and ennoble them and make them a praise in the earth. But it was necessary for them to encounter difficulties and to endure privations. God was bringing them from a state of degradation and fitting them to occupy an honorable place among the nations and to receive important and sacred trusts. Had they possessed faith in him in view of all that he had wrought for them, they would cheerfully have borne inconvenience, privation, and even real suffering but they were unwilling to trust the Lord any further than they could witness the continual evidences of His power. They forgot their bitter service in Egypt. They forgot the goodness and power of God displayed in their behalf in their deliverance from bondage. They forgot how their children had been spared when the destroying angel slew all the firstborn of Egypt. 
They forgot the grand exhibition of divine power at the Red Sea. They forgot that while they had crossed safely in the path that had been opened for them, the armies of their enemies attempting to follow them had been overwhelmed by the waters of the sea. They saw and felt only their present inconveniences and trials. And instead of saying, God has done great things for us, whereas we were slaves, he is making of us a great nation, they talked of the hardness of the way and wondered when their weary pilgrimage would end. The history of the wilderness life of Israel was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God to the close of time. The record of God's dealings with the wanderers of the desert in all their marchings to and fro, in their exposure to hunger, thirst, and weariness, and in the striking manifestations of His power for their relief, is fraught with warning and instruction for His people in all ages. The varied experience of the Hebrews was a school of preparation for their promised home in Canaan. God would have His people in these days review with a humble heart and teachable spirit the trials through which ancient Israel passed, that they may be instructed in their preparation for the heavenly Canaan. Many look back to the Israelites and marvel at their unbelief and murmuring, feeling that they themselves would not have been so ungrateful. But when their faith is tested, even by little trials, they manifest no more faith or patience than did ancient Israel. When brought into straight places, they murmur at the process by which God has chosen to purify them. Though their present needs are supplied, many are unwilling to trust God for the future, and they are in constant anxiety lest poverty shall come upon them, and their children shall be left to suffer. Some are always anticipating evil, or magnifying the difficulties that really exist, so that their eyes are blinded to the many blessings which demand their gratitude. The obstacles they encounter, instead of leading them to seek help from God, the only source of strength, separate them from Him, because they awaken unrest and repining. Do we well to be thus unbelieving? Why should we be ungrateful and distrustful? Jesus is our friend, all heaven is interested in our welfare, and our anxiety and fear grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We should not indulge in a solicitude that only frets and wears us, but does not help us to bear trials. No place should be given to that distrust of God which leads us to make a preparation against future want the chief pursuit of life, as though our happiness consisted in these earthly things. It is not the will of God that His people should be weighed down with care. But our Lord does not tell us that there are no dangers in our path. He does not propose to take His people out of the world of sin and evil, but He points us to a never-failing refuge. He invites the weary and care-laden, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lay off the yoke of anxiety and worldly care that you have placed on your own neck, and take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. We may find rest and peace in God, casting all our care upon Him, for He careth for us. See 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Says the Apostle Paul, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. In view of all that God has wrought for us, our faith should be strong, active, and enduring. Instead of murmuring and complaining, the language of our hearts should be, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. God was not unmindful of the wants of Israel. He said to their leader, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And directions were given that the people gather a daily supply, with a double amount on the sixth day, that the sacred observance of the Sabbath might be maintained. Moses assured the congregation that their wants were to be supplied. The Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. And he added, What are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. He further bade Aaron say to them, 
Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. While Aaron was speaking, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. A splendor such as they had never witnessed symbolized the divine presence. Through manifestations addressed to their senses, they were to obtain a knowledge of God. They must be taught that the Most High, and not merely the man Moses, was their leader, that they might fear his name and obey his voice. At nightfall the camp was surrounded by vast flocks of quails, enough to supply the entire company. In the morning there lay upon the surface of the ground a small round thing, as small as the hoar-frost. It was like coriander seed, white. The people called it manna. Moses said, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. The people gathered the manna and found that there was an abundant supply for all. They ground it in mills, or beat it in a mortar, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. Numbers chapter 11, verse 8. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. They were directed to gather daily an omer for every person, and they were not to leave of it until the morning. Some attempted to keep a supply until the next day, but it was then found to be unfit for food. The provision for the day must be gathered in the morning, for all that remained upon the ground was melted by the sun. In the gathering of the manna it was found that some obtained more and some less than the stipulated amount. But when they did meet it, with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. An explanation of this scripture as well as a practical lesson from it is given by the Apostle Paul in his second epistle to the Corinthians. He says, I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality, as it is written, He that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 to 15. On the sixth day the people gathered two omers for every person. The rulers hastened to acquaint Moses with what had been done. His answer was, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. They did so, and found that it remained unchanged. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. God requires that his holy day be as sacredly observed now as in the time of Israel. The command given to the Hebrews should be regarded by all Christians as an injunction from Jehovah to them. The day before the Sabbath should be made a day of preparation that everything may be in readiness for its sacred hours. In no case should our own business be allowed to encroach upon holy time. God has directed that the sick and suffering be cared for. The labor required to make them comfortable is a work of mercy and no violation of the Sabbath. But all unnecessary work should be avoided. Many carelessly put off till the beginning of the Sabbath little things that might have been done on the day of preparation. This should not be. Work that is neglected until the beginning of the Sabbath should remain undone until it is past. This course might help the memory of those thoughtless ones and make them careful to do their own work on the six working days. Every week during their long sojourn in the wilderness, the Israelites witnessed a threefold miracle designed to impress their minds with the sacredness of the Sabbath. A double quantity of manna fell on the sixth day, none on the seventh and the portion needed for the Sabbath was preserved, sweet and pure, when, if any were kept over at any other time, it became unfit for use. In the circumstances connected with the giving of the manna, we have conclusive evidence that the Sabbath was not instituted, as many claim, when the law was given at Sinai. Before the Israelites came to Sinai, they understood the Sabbath to be obligatory upon them. In being obliged to gather every Friday a double portion of manna in preparation for the Sabbath, when none would fall, 
the sacred nature of the day of rest was continually impressed upon them. And when some of the people went out on the Sabbath to gather manna, the Lord asked, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? The children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came under the borders of the land of Canaan. For forty years they were daily reminded by this miraculous provision of God's unfailing care and tender love. In the words of the psalmist, God gave them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. Psalm 78, verses 24 and 25. That is, food provided for them by the angels. Sustained by the corn of heaven, they were daily taught that, having God's promise, they were as secure from want as if surrounded by fields of waving grain on the fertile plains of Canaan. The manna falling from heaven for the sustenance of Israel was a type of him who came from God to give life to the world. Said Jesus, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51. And among the promises of blessing to God's people in the future life, it is written, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. After leaving the wilderness of sin, the Israelites encamped in Rephidim. Here there was no water, and again they distrusted the providence of God. In their blindness and presumption, the people came to Moses with the demand, Give us water that we may drink. But his patience failed not. Why chide ye with me, he said? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? They cried in anger, Wherefore is this, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? When they had been so abundantly supplied with food, they remembered with shame their unbelief and murmurings, and promised to trust the Lord in the future. But they soon forgot their promise, and failed at the first trial of their faith. The pillar of cloud that was leading them seemed to veil a fearful mystery. And Moses, who was he? They questioned. And what could be his object in bringing them from Egypt? Suspicion and distrust filled their hearts, and they boldly accused him of designing to kill them and their children by privations and hardships that he might enrich himself with their possessions. In the tumult of rage and indignation they were about to stone him. In distress Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do unto this people? He was directed to take the elders of Israel and the rod wherewith he had wrought wonders in Egypt, and to go on before the people. And the Lord said unto him, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. He obeyed, and the waters burst forth in a living stream that abundantly supplied the encampment. Instead of commanding Moses to lift up his rod and call down some terrible plague, like those on Egypt, Upon the leaders in this wicked murmuring, the Lord in his great mercy made the rod his instrument to work their deliverance. He clave the rocks in the wilderness, and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock, and caused waters to run down like rivers. Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16. Moses smote the rock, but it was the Son of God who, veiled in the cloudy pillar, stood beside Moses and caused the life-giving water to flow. Not only Moses and the elders, but all the congregation who stood at a distance, beheld the glory of the Lord. But had the cloud been removed, they would have been slain by the terrible brightness of him who abode therein. In their thirst the people had tempted God, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? If God has brought us here, why does he not give us water as well as bread? The unbelief thus manifested was criminal, and Moses feared that the judgments of God would rest upon them, and he called the name of the place Massa, temptation, and Meribah, chiding, as a memorial of their sin. A new danger now threatened them. Because of their murmuring against him, the Lord suffered them to be attacked by their enemies. 
The Amalekites, a fierce warlike tribe inhabiting that region, came out against them and smote those who, faint and weary, had fallen into the rear. Moses, knowing that the masses of the people were unprepared for battle, directed Joshua to choose from the different tribes a body of soldiers and lead them on the morrow against the enemy, while he himself would stand on an eminence nearby with the rod of God in his hand. Accordingly, the next day Joshua and his company attacked the foe, while Moses and Aaron and Hur were stationed on a hill overlooking the battlefield. With arms outstretched toward heaven, and holding the rod of God in his right hand, Moses prayed for the success of the armies of Israel. As the battle progressed, it was observed that so long as his hands were reaching upward, Israel prevailed. But when they were lowered, the enemy was victorious. As Moses became weary, Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands until the going down of the sun when the enemy was put to flight. As Aaron and Hur supported the hands of Moses, they showed the people their duty to sustain him in his arduous work while he should receive the word from God to speak to them. And the act of Moses also was significant, showing that God held their destiny in his hands. While they made him their trust, he would fight for them and subdue their enemies. But when they should let go their hold upon him and trust in their own power, they would be even weaker than those who had not the knowledge of God and their foes would prevail against them. As the Hebrews triumphed when Moses was reaching his hands toward heaven and interceding in their behalf, so the Israel of God prevail when they by faith take hold upon the strength of their mighty helper. Yet divine strength is to be combined with human effort. Moses did not believe that God would overcome their foes while Israel remained inactive. While the great leader was pleading with the Lord, Joshua and his brave followers were putting forth their utmost efforts to repulse the enemies of Israel and of God. After the defeat of the Amalekites, God directed Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Just before his death, the great leader delivered to his people the solemn charge, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 to 19. Concerning this wicked people, the Lord declared, The hand of Amalek is against the throne of Jehovah. Exodus chapter 17, verse 16, margin. The Amalekites were not ignorant of God's character or of his sovereignty, but instead of fearing before him, they had set themselves to defy his power. The wonders wrought by Moses before the Egyptians were made a subject of mockery by the people of Amalek, and the fears of surrounding nations were ridiculed. They had taken oath by their gods that they would destroy the Hebrews, so that not one should escape, and they boasted that Israel's God would be powerless to resist them. They had not been injured or threatened by the Israelites. Their assault was wholly unprovoked. It was to manifest their hatred and defiance of God that they had sought to destroy his people. The Amalekites had long been high-handed sinners, and their crimes had cried to God for vengeance. Yet his mercy had still called them to repentance. But when the men of Amalek fell upon the wearied and defenseless ranks of Israel, they sealed their nation's doom. The care of God is over the weakest of his children. No act of cruelty or oppression toward them is unmarked by heaven. Over all who love and fear him, his hand extends as a shield. Let men beware that they smite not that hand, for it wields the sword of justice. Not far distant from where the Israelites were now encamped was the home of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Jethro had heard of the deliverance of the Hebrews, and he now set out to visit them and restore to Moses his wife and two sons. The great leader was informed by messengers of their approach, and he went out with joy to meet them, and the first greetings over conducted them to his tent. He had sent back his family when on his way to the perils of leading Israel from Egypt, but now he could again enjoy the relief and comfort of their society. To Jethro he recounted the wonderful dealings of God with Israel 
And the patriarch rejoiced and blessed the Lord, and with Moses and the elders he united in offering sacrifice and holding a solemn feast in commemoration of God's mercy. As Jethro remained in the camp, he soon saw how heavy were the burdens that rested upon Moses. To maintain order and discipline among that vast, ignorant, and untrained multitude was indeed a stupendous task. Moses was their recognized leader and magistrate, and not only the general interests and duties of the people, but the controversies that arose among them were referred to him. He had permitted this, for it gave him an opportunity to instruct them. As he said, I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. But Jethro remonstrated against this, saying, This thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Thou wilt surely wear away. And he counseled Moses to appoint proper persons as rulers of thousands, and others as rulers of hundreds, and others of tens. They should be able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. These were to judge in all matters of minor consequence, while the most difficult and important cases should still be brought before Moses, who was to be to the people, said Jethro, to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. This counsel was accepted, and it not only brought relief to Moses, but resulted in establishing more perfect order among the people. The Lord had greatly honored Moses, and had wrought wonders by his hand. But the fact that he had been chosen to instruct others did not lead him to conclude that he himself needed no instruction. The chosen leader of Israel listened gladly to the suggestions of the godly priest of Midian, and adopted his plan as a wise arrangement. From Rephidim the people continued their journey, following the movement of the cloudy pillar. Their route had led across barren plains, over steep ascents, and through rocky defiles. Often, as they had traversed the sandy wastes, they had seen before them rugged mountains like huge bulwarks piled up directly across their course, and seeming to forbid all further progress. But as they approached, openings here and there appeared in the mountain wall, and beyond, another plain opened to view. Through one of the deep gravelly passes they were now led. It was a grand and impressive scene. Between the rocky cliffs rising hundreds of feet on either side flowed in a living tide far as the eye could reach the hosts of Israel with their flocks and herds. And now before them in solemn majesty Mount Sinai lifted its massive front. The cloudy pillar rested upon its summit, and the people spread their tents upon the plain beneath. Here was to be their home for nearly a year. At night the pillar of fire assured them of the divine protection, and while they were locked in slumber the bread of heaven fell gently upon the encampment. The dawn gilded the dark ridges of the mountains, and the sun's golden rays pierced the deep gorges, seeming to these weary travelers like beams of mercy from the throne of God. On every hand vast rugged heights seemed in their solitary grandeur to speak of eternal endurance and majesty. Here the mind was impressed with solemnity and awe. Man was made to feel his ignorance and weakness in the presence of him who weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Here Israel was to receive the most wonderful revelation ever made by God to man. Here the Lord had gathered his people, that he might impress upon them the sacredness of his requirements by declaring with his own voice his holy law. Great and radical changes were to be wrought in them, for the degrading influences of servitude and long-continued association with idolatry had left their mark upon the habits and character. God was working to lift them to a higher moral level by giving them a knowledge of himself.